Hello, my name is Nick Easley, CEO of 3C Consulting. And today for Cannabis Unfiltered, we're going to talk about some of the special things to consider if you're an outdoor cultivator. Kind of fitting time, seeing that we're in the fall, and season colors are starting to change up here in the high country of Colorado, got to put on a sweater. But when you're thinking about outdoor, many times, unless you're really near the equator, you've got one shot at harvest. And that really harvesting is all of those successes from those moments are all going to come from the planning that happens over the winter and the early spring. So as you're right now in the throngs of harvest and carrying around buckets of colas and hanging up plants in barns and drying facilities and trying to coordinate when to harvest, understanding when plants are mature to take those out of the field, it's really everything that you're going to learn from your operations this year that are going to set you up for success in these next years. Now, outdoor is the most natural thing you can do, but starting plants early, other than just you know, Johnny apple seeding and putting a bunch of seeds out in the ground like a normal farm, which you can do, this is a very resilient plant, but really considering the quality and consistency of genetics that you're gonna have next year. And if you're gonna be doing that, how and when do you actually start making your stock plants, your mother plants, taking clones, or if you're gonna be doing feminized seeds, when and how are you actually gonna like germinate those and get those into a field? So there's a multi-step process, and the first thing is, the, is really determining like your stock plants. Building a facility that's gonna have the optimal environments for you to make massive mother plants that you're gonna be able to take consistent cuttings off of. Now, depending on the season and where you are and your latitude and long longitude, typically the best time to start putting plants outside would be anywhere from May 15th to about June 30th. There's about a six week window there and like there's obviously the ideal time. But during that, typically with my large scale outdoor operations, I'll really consider how can I have six different groupings going to the fields. And then if it takes on average a little less than two weeks for a a plant to completely root through the cloning process and really get mature enough to transplant into, let's say a four inch by four inch nursery container or like a three inch like cow manure type pod, like really thinking like how and when do I need to take these cuttings? Now you've got a couple options on how you could be doing tissue culture, you could be doing cloning, working from seeds. If you start from just seeds that are normal seeds, males and females are gonna be part of that mixture. So you're gonna need enough time to actually germinate enough seeds Wait for some time without altering the photo period to try to see who the males are first because you never want to interrupt and mess with the plant's life cycle and its light photo period. And then actually taking, taking clones from those females, flowering those clones out to see like who's good on a testing basis and then determine which stock plants you're going to use as your master stock for the farm. Or you could get some clones from someone else, but if you're going to do that, make sure to quarantine those, really clean and observe those. And if possible, look at test results from those varieties or see those plants growing in their flowering state to determine what's gonna be best for you. Now, when you're choosing varieties, something that's really unique in 2020, on top of you know zombie apocalypse and coronavirus and everything else that's happening, is that we've had some pretty interesting weather patterns and events that have really impacted the West Coast and all over the country, from massive hurricane rains, flooding out hemp crops, hail damage, huge fires in Colorado, California, Oregon, and Washington, not to mention some of the early snows that we had in Colorado up to a foot in some places that really just devastated outdoor varieties. So when you're thinking about what varieties to use, not a big fan of some of these terms, but like indicas, sativas, hybrids, cushes, and so forth, but typically like more indica dominant varieties are gonna flower faster. Their genetics are originally from further north on the equator. That means they're going to finish faster because winter would come faster there can, can, you know, compared to plants that are growing closer to the equator. So depending on where you are, really choose genetics that are going to be coming in before your last frost. Now, temperature is an amazing thing that you know, can make... Pl I've seen plants go down to 24 degrees before they died. But you want to have a, a variety of genetics. If you just did one, one variety, let's say sour diesel, if you had 100,000 sour diesel plants from let's say six stock plants, they're gonna be pretty consistent. But if those are a late flowering variety and seasons start to get cold or there might, you know, the weather's kind of, you know, changing really fast and really early, you might lose a whole crop that might frost out or mold out. So having a variety of different plants in the field, that kind of diversity is gonna give you a better hedge strategy just in case there are adverse uh, weather events that happen during this. But if you're going to be starting a large scale outdoor, thinking of that diversity of genetics and having a really solid, large head house where you'll be able to have your stock plants, be able to take your clones, get those clones rooted, you can actually do all of this in a greenhouse. 
Most people think it has to be just indoors. It can actually be in a greenhouse if you maintain your temperature as well. And typically most commercial cultivators only use CO2 enrichment in like flowering rooms or flowering bays and greenhouses, but it will significantly help your cloning success and vegetative health of your plants if you're able to actually augment CO2 into those environments. If you're doing this in a greenhouse and maintaining proper temperatures, you know, nighttime air flows, and being able to do CO2 enrichment and maintain the right humidity levels, you can actually do some pretty massive large-scale headhouses without copious amounts of infrastructure. So really think of what resources do you have? Do you have enough water? Do you have enough power? Is there natural gas available? But what systems you're going to need to be able to make as many clones as possible to actually fill your fields? Now, the most environmental and lowest cost of production methodology you can do in cannabis is large scale outdoor. But if you've ever seen those large plants in Northern California, those pictures, like cannabis could be easily a 12 foot tall, 12 foot wide bush if you start your varieties early enough. Something that's really key to save on labor as these plants are actually moving to the field is how do you amend those plots? Where are you going to be planting these? What sort of tractor would you use to be able to have four rows or six rows or eight rows of clones going into the field or plants that you've been able to vegetate a little bit longer? If you're able to get a topping in on plants before they go to the field to keep them a little bit shorter and thin out those smaller arms, it's a lot easier just to have all of those plants in one place instead of someone walking down the field, bending over and trying to like top each one correctly. As you think too for like labor savings, Everything for outdoor, it can add up when it comes to labor. If you don't plan things, you want to have the most consistency of genetics, the most consistent automated drip fertigation and irrigation systems, testing those fertigation systems, your well pumps, your pH, your water temperatures. Are you able to pull from ponds or make retaining kind of uh, reservoirs? Planning that sort of infrastructure during the winter and not once you get plants in the field is the most important. When it comes to types of irrigation, I've seen everything from furrows, like these trenches, kind of water trenches that go between plant rows, from pivots, like those big crop circle alien looking things like, that are typically used on corn and other types of crops. But the thing with cannabis is you're getting those big dense inflorescence and in these colas in like the late summer, early fall and fall, they're a lot more prone, prone to mold and doing overhead watering can just increase that sort of risk. So avoiding like giant football sprinklers, avoiding pivots. Furrow irrigation is pretty inefficient and wasteful on a water standpoint, but really the most, most common and what we recommend is using an automated drip system with like with drip tape and putting that in, in through your plant rows and your beds. Now, trying not to just water one time a day, having multiple pulses that can actually deliver water and nutrients at the right pH, the right water temperature, the right parts per million for certain nutrients, and keeping really good logs. Something you really want to consider early on before even doing your field prep is getting some you know, randomized soil samples from your fields from like you know the first few inches down low, throwing a tennis ball behind your shoulder all over the place and then digging wherever that ball lands so you're trying to like reduce your bias and selecting where you're going to plant and what samples you take. Get those tested by a soils lab. Same thing with your water. Understand what you're working with first before you come up with your nutrient or your fertigation plans. You know, love organic farming and I think that biomimicry is the most important thing we can do as cultivators and agriculturalists in the cannabis industry. But how do you have really good diverse soil health? How do you increase, increasingly add additional carbon? You know, if it's cow manures, if it's like tilling certain things in, cover cropping. In the fall after you harvest this year and you pull out any remaining stalks, you don't really want that, that soil to sit barren. Like what sort of cover crops could you use? And there's a difference in cover crops. Winter cover crops are what you're going to plant this fall that are going to grow a bit, kind of die. Those will get tilled into the field the following year. And also varieties, cover crops that you would plant in the spring that are going to keep the soil covered, be doing nitrogen cycling. I mean, different types of uh, ground cherries, alfalfas, you know, having a good mixture for your, your soil. And that's where talking to normal farmers in your area. Like, what are they, they doing? Now, not just the large-scale commercial kind of industrial farmers, but get to know the other farmers in your area. They've dealt with everything that you're going to deal with. What are the most common pests that they see? What are some of the things they need to plan for? And when you're thinking about coming from an indoor or a greenhouse mentality to outdoor, there's always this idea that you got to love the plants. And yes, you got to love the plants, but it's not through wasting your time on each and every plant. If you're thinking about having 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 plants or more, 
How do you consistently get those plants to the field with as many of the treatments as possible? Topping, training, thinning, inoculating. Being able to do those during your up, up potting or your transplant times will greatly reduce the amount of labor that you're going to be looking at happening in the fields. And there's also that idea of that you have to stake every single plant and stake out all these arms and put all these clips and wires on these plants. It's simply not the case. For these plants, if you can have consistent genetics going into your fields that are topped and thinned into a large scale trellising type system, most common if you look into some of the things for commercial tomatoes or for commercial wineries for grapes, it's the lowest cost options you can do for massive plantations of cannabis. And think about like music notes, you know, T posts every, let's say 20 feet. And this is, you put these in after the plants are in the field and then starting a string of line that goes from one post to the other. And then as the plants start to grow, you can use tomato clips and hook to that line and then also use other strings to wrap, wrap around those plants. Commonly in the industry, we call that double dutching, kind of like jump roping. But being able to weave those through about once every week to two during those early stages of growth in the fields, the plants kind of make a nice netted wall. Now, everyone thinks from an indoor standpoint, you have to trellis net out the plants and spread them all out. When it comes to large scale outdoor, it's all about volume. How do you create the most volume of plant material with the least amount of touch points for the lowest amount of cost? That's still going to provide the services that you need to these plants. But when you're thinking about what to do this winter, think about your infrastructure, your power, what things need to be ordered. You know, large scale trim equipment and drying and curing, that's all going to come. And that's like the joy that you get to experience and you definitely want to plan that out. But early on, focus on the infrastructure for the plants for your fertigation or for your head house. How much labor are you going to need from these? Where are you going to source your genetics? What sort of materials do you need to start giving those plants a good environment and start them early? And start looking at some timelines and calendars for when do you need to take these cuttings? When do you hope to get them into the fields? What sort of implements and machinery are you going to use? These aren't things in High Times Magazine that are gonna tell you what to use here. Um, like for smaller scale indoor things, really look to commercial agriculture for a lot of the guidance that you're going to need as you really plan your outdoor operations. Good preventative controls are the most important thing to help you from pests and diseases and having very healthy plants go to the fields. But the more biodiversity that you have in your cover crops or some of these things that we call guardian plants, certain varieties of different plants that produce compounds that keep bad bugs away or houses for good bugs that are going to stay around to like fight your bad bugs. It's really a biological journey that you undertake on large scale outdoor. There's always that idea too that you need to plastic your rows. I'm pretty anti-plastic unless it's certain climates. If possible, doing like trenches or amending your whole field and then putting amendments in the rows where you're going to transplant, tilling that in and then direct planting into that. That's like earthworm castings, green sand, azomite, all of these different biological inputs that you can quickly and easily and pretty inexpensively add to the fields. The more healthy soil that you have, the less you really need to feed the plants and focus on biomimicry. How do you introduce really beneficial bacteria and fungi into your soil that you're actually feeding that soil network versus trying to supplementally feed a plant with salt-based nutrients? Now, salts are the most common thing for large-scale outdoor, but not the most environmental option, can be a much more expensive option, but looking into the biological route, depending on what your soil has, and matching your nutrients based on your soil, based on the phase of growth that you'll be feeding your plants, and based on what water you're having. Now, you might be used to having to do reverse osmosis or some sort of water filtration for your commercial facilities. That might not be the case, or even possible or feasible on large-scale outdoor. That's why sometimes we look at settling ponds, certain larger reservoirs, and really trying to avoid municipal water when possible for all that additional chlorine and things that might be in the municipal water stream that you wouldn't want to be putting into a biologically healthy soil ecosystem. Outdoor always comes down to planning though. And the shit shows that we see come from when people weren't planning, didn't have their capital in order, were trying to do too many things at one time, or had never undertaken an operation of this size and scale. There are more things to consider and when things go wrong, it goes wrong for tens of hundreds of thousands of plants. So really being on top of your planning for, for your outdoor harvests. And you know, typically you might be used to harvesting one plant at a time. Doing selective harvest of getting as much value out of the field during these times or if you see large scale hurricane rains coming, how can you harvest it really aggressively before that? 
And when you're harvesting those colas, cutting at a 45 degree angle so you don't get these flat tops where you might get additional mold. Going through the fields and inspecting your different varieties, top, medium, low. By usually the first week of September, we'll start selectively harvesting you know, buds from the top of the plant, the medium part of the plant, and the lower part of the canopy, homogenizing those and getting those tested for cannabinoid profiles to see how these cannabinoids are maturing and developing. Because you might be used to a variety harvesting always at the same time, 55 days. Well, that might be 55 days of 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. Remember, every day from June 21st, the days slowly get shorter in the Northern Hemisphere from the summer solstice until then like the equinox, which just happened, and then like the days are less than 12 hours. So plants don't flower as quickly when they're in an outdoor field as you might be used to them in a controlled environment of 12 hours of light, 12 hours of darkness. But outdoor operations have massive potential for success and really creating bulk amounts of product at the lowest possible price. States that allowed outdoor, when it came to Colorado, Oregon, Washington, uh, Calif California, you know, and, and many new states, when there's just a big surge of outdoor that comes every fall, this is what you really need to plan for of how do you sell enough to cover some of those costs, continue to actually cure and maintain really good product integrity on your products, and then how do you create additional value adds with that? Outdoor plants are, are notorious, just like the notorious RBG. Rest in peace, Ruth. <laughs> but <laughs> outdoor plants are notorious for when they when they come in for harvest time, like that whole season, they're making so much additional oils. When you think about UV light, UVA, UVB, UVC that exists in natural sunlight, which plants have had for hundreds of millions of years and they're big fans of, and our little monkey brains never make lights for indoors or greenhouses that are as good as the sun. Using them a little bit for augmentation is fine, but outdoor plants are always creating additional oils as essentially like a sunscreen for their sex organs. So the more UVA, UVB, the more potency, the more oils. Outdoor plants, large scale, long term, you're going to notice that outdoor plantations will have combines harvesting huge plants and just turning them all into oil. Harvesting corn, making corn syrup right next door. Like some of the biggest places might be, you know, it could be Columbia, could be Iowa, could be all these places where the natural vectors and vectors being like, Daytime highs, nighttime lows, annual precipitation, common dew points. All of those things really matter for how and where do you select to grow large-scale cannabis plantations at the lowest possible price. But outdoor plants for oil processing, be it for bubble hash, be it for keef, be it for rosin, any way that you're able to think about those additional value adds and really avoiding when you get large-scale commercial, avoiding the Northern California mentality of like hanging whole plants in the barn. Like you really want to start to consider large scale industrial trim machines that automate the process. A lot of the buckers right now that kind of like strip and shuck the plant buds off kind of suck and they're really expensive. Hint, somebody makes some better ones. We'd be really excited about that. But looking into these larger scale implements for sorting or for UV light that can actually help after the buds on like getting rid of some of those potential yeasts and molds that might've been on the plant in those late stages of uh, development. But outdoor is really the way of the future. Greenhouse for four season hybrid greenhouses, that's probably where most large scale flower is going to come from long term because you can get five, six harvests a year out of that, do CO2 enrichment. But using your greenhouses to be able to create plantations, if your state allows, you've got the driver's seat. Now, sadly, some states like California, they might limit you to an acre of parcel. Um, see like where you can stack these or where you're not limited on plant counts and where can you really do this in a compliant manner with all the security and protocols needed and plan out that drying volume and, and calculations for what you're going to need for that. But this is the time, like building those fires, planning your outdoor cultivation operations from the infrastructure to your staffing, to selecting your varieties. It's the most important thing you can do as soon as you get all of that keef off your hands after harvesting and finishing up your operations this year. But you know, start planning for the future now because next year, a lot of the problems that you might have experienced this year won't exist if you can sit around the fire this winter and come up with a really dedicated plan. If you have any questions or need any help with your large scale outdoors, we're more than welcome to help. I've been doing this for over 14 years and really look at everything from an agricultural standpoint, not just a cannabis standpoint, because you know we didn't invent agriculture, we're a part of it. And when it comes to cannabis, the most environmental and profitable thing you can do is biomimicry versus a four-story brick building where you just have thousand watt lights rolling for days. Been a pleasure to talk to you. My name is Nick Easley, CEO of 3C. This has been Cannabis Unfiltered. 
outdoor. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs>